Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to ReproAction's Act and Learn webinar for the month of August 2022. Uh, very excited to discuss with you this important topic. Um, it is, yes, they are already coming for your birth control. So first, we'll introduce your host. I'll introduce myself first. Um, the voice you're hearing is Erin Matson. I use she, her pronouns. I am co-founder and executive director of ReproAction. I'm based in Washington, D.C., and um, I am on Twitter at Erin to the Max. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here with y'all this afternoon. My name is Anvita Kondru. I use she and they pronouns, and I'm one of the campaign coordinators here at ReproAction, and I'm based in Dallas. Awesome. Well, let's get down right to it. We've got a packed agenda. So first, we'll introduce ReproAction, and then um, we will talk about how the anti-abortion movement is against birth control. And I want to say that very clearly. Yes, the anti-abortion movement is against birth control. Sometimes they try to hide the ball on that. Um, but increasingly, after the fall of Roe, they are being quite open about their intentions. And yes, they're already after your birth control. Um, then we'll move into a panel discussion, and we're really excited to be joined by two experts in the field um, who will enrich this discussion. First up will be Angela Maskey. Angela um, is with Advocates for Youth and a spectacular organization that organizes young people in support of reproductive health. And um, in particular, we'll talk about some really exciting developments um, to get a birth control pill available over the counter. And there's been a lot of exciting developments, so that'll be great. Um, and then next, we'll be joined by our colleague Nicola Brogan, who is with the American Society for Emergency Contraception, talking all about emergency contraception. I'm so happy to have this expertise on the call today, because as we know, abortion opponents for so long have been desperate um, to conflate birth control with abortion when that's just simply not the science. Um, then we will move to next steps and um, do Q&A. A couple of housekeeping matters. First, if you have questions at any point, um, whether for your hosts or for our panelists, encourage you to put them into the questions tab. We'll get to as many as possible at the end. You don't have to wait until Q&A to type them in. Um, and then also, if you are a uh, person on Twitter, we would love to have you uh, live tweet. You're welcome to do so. And just encourage you to use the hashtag ReproAction, which makes it a lot easier for folks who are following along that way to see it. So with that, we will dive in. So a little bit about ReproAction, the organization bringing this um, presentation to you today. A ReproAction leads bold direct action to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We're deeply proud of our left flank analysis and we're known for our willingness to hold folks on all sides of the issues we work on accountable, whether they're traditionally considered allies or opposition. Let me say that in another way. We're fearless in calling out who needs to be called out. And we have a deep commitment to nonviolent direct action as one of the tools in our toolbox. So just to set the table, yes, indeed, they are already coming for your birth control. And when I say they, I mean the anti-abortion movement. I mean anti-abortion legislators. I mean that entire hate-filled apparatus. And it's actually happening with stunning speed um, in terms of how public they're being following uh, Roe being overturned. And uh, both I and Anvita will provide you with some examples of that shortly. But I want to start by introducing a really well-intentioned statement that I know I've heard a lot, and I suspect you, our listeners who care about this issue, have heard a lot, where people say, couldn't we all just come together and work to reduce unintended pregnancies, no matter how we feel about abortion? Shouldn't pro-life people support birth control? Doesn't everybody support birth control? Well, first, let's take a step uh, in one direction and say pretty clearly that we know that um, statistically women are incredibly supportive of birth control. And I'm using gendered language intentionally. I want to be clear that uh, because of the science or not the science, excuse me, 
um, because of the research that only uh, tells us women specifically. But I, I want to be very clear that people of all genders use birth control, and this is a genderless issue, and that is the real science. Um, so, uh, but just to be clear, you know, they don't support birth control, even though the overwhelming majority of American women will use birth control at some point in their reproductive lives. And we're talking in the high 90%, and that even tracks for Catholic women, for example. Um, the statement um, contains a logic that doesn't fit reality. The fact is the anti-abortion movement opposes birth control, and it always has. Um, and just to be very clear, uh, pro-life is a totalitarian worldview that's replated uh, related to replacement theory. Replacement theory is an extremely racist, uh, nativist theory um, that aims to uh, inspire white supremacist violence by suggesting that the demographics of our country are shifting too far away from a white majority country. So um, I want to talk a little bit just to set the table because it really does tie to why um, they are anti-birth control, anti-abortion, anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ, anti-Black, and extremely racist. Um, there are three concepts that are working in tandem for the anti-abortion movement, and they're really seeking to increase the supply of white babies for the purpose of ensuring that white male dominance and the demographic dominance of white people. The first is white supremacy or the idea that white people should hold more power over society, uh, forcibly sold. So um, second is gender roles and this idea, and I wanna be very clear that gender and biological sex are not the same thing, um, though they are often conflated, especially by the uh, right wing, um, but by enforcing rigid gender roles that supports uh, white supremacy and uh, by enforcing white supremacy that supports uh, rigid gender roles. And then finally, reproductive oppression. And this is a concept that, uh, that is about uh, specifically uh, denying people their reproductive autonomy uh, for the purpose of control. So all of these things are working together and it is part of how uh, 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 one should understand the anti-abortion movement that is in fact anti-birth control contrary to that sweet seeming statement that a lot of people will hear that, you know, couldn't we all just support birth control? Well, we should, but they don't. Um, and I want to just give you some like ripped from the headlines. So this here is, um, is the president of March for Life. Um, Jeannie Mancini has an article in the right wing blog site Town Hall saying the March for Life is not backing out of the federal fight over abortion. And note in this piece that was just uh, just came out a few days ago, um, she also outlines um, opposition to uh, the Right to Contraception Act, um, which aims to defend and shore up the right to contraception after um, after a justice uh, from the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas, had actually identified um, in his uh in his opinion on Dobbs or in his concurring opinion that he would very much like to go after Griswold v. Connecticut, the Supreme Court decision that um, affirmed the federal constitutional right to birth control. Um, but you see here uh, what you see in Mancini's language, which I won't, won't repeat, but um, they are definitely seeking to conflate uh, birth control with, um, with medication abortion and also um, raising the, the specter of, um, of a misappropriation of the concept of religious freedom um, and trying to uh, refuse and deny uh, people's access to birth control. Um, and this one I just wanna share with you is a moment. And I wanna acknowledge that for those of us who care about reproductive health rights and justice, um, there have been a lot of challenging moments um, in the past two months, uh, no doubt about it. And I will say, looking at this one knocked the wind out of me because it really blatantly shows their strategy. At this point, um, what we see are very large groups such as Students for Life. Don't be fooled by the name. This is a group that um, that was uh, has leadership uh, deep in the Federalist Society. Um, uh, which is that institution that has really worked to remake our courts over the decades, um, tons of uh, right-wing um, power and money. 
people like former Governor Scott Walker sit on their board. So just to be clear, this isn't just like a sweet little club um, sitting on a college campus. But they are now saying that you can see it. Um, basically, all forms of hormonal birth control, including birth control, pills, um, IUDs, patches, shots, implants, vaginal rings, and emergency contraception are um, abortifacients. And I have to tell you, this knocked the wind out of me when I saw it because I realized that here I am a person, and if they are saying that, the, that these are abortifacients, I'm at a point in my life where I don't think it's possible for me to count the number of abortions I've had. Um, when I think about the number of uh, menstrual cycles that I've had um, using some of these uh, these very common uh, forms of contraception. And so if they're alleging that these are all abortifacients, um, well, that just doesn't comport with their reality. Are they, are they truly saying that every month um, so many people of all genders who are on birth control are actually having abortions. It is ridiculous, but it's a really concerning strategy because it shows the leading edge of where we are headed. So I will pass it to Anvita to go through some more examples of what they're doing. Thanks, Erin. So I'll be giving an overview, kind of expanding on everything Erin just talked about of how the anti-abortion movement has been sort of building this foundation to attack birth control legality and access. Um, so I want to start off by discussing some more examples of the anti-abortion movement defining certain methods of birth control as abortifacients or things that cause abortion. So um, in a recent series of posts from last month, the organization very prominent organization, 40 Days for Life, posted talking points for their followers around contraception and abortion. Um, and so you can see the post says, many of the most popular methods of contraception can actually cause early term abortions. And um, it sort of explains that hormonal forms of contraception, including the birth control pills, the patch, morning after pill or plan B, hormonal IUDs and injectable birth control have three different ways to prevent birth. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, it continues on. Oh, I think there's one slide before this one. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so continuing on with their posts, they sort of explain these three different methods of um, how contraception works. And so the third method is um, changing the lining of a woman's uterus so that a newly conceived embryo cannot implant and receive nourishment necessary for survival. And they say the third method is an abortifacient because it kills a newly conceived human before he or she can implant safely in the mother's womb. And it says non-hormonal IUDs also prevent implantation. And here they use this term silent abortion, and they say when abortifacient birth control works by preventing implantation, it means a woman has a silent abortion before she realizes she has conceived a new life. So here we can see that 40 Days for Life has outright stated that some forms of birth control prevent implantation and therefore are equivalent to having an abortion. Um, so similarly, Kristen Hawk. Hawkins, the president of Students for Life and Students for Life Action, um, which is the organization Erin was just talking about, has made a video where she falsely states that Plan B causes an abortion. Um, so in the video, um, you can see on the slide what she's saying. Um, so basically, she's kind of echoing the language that 40 Days for Life was using um, by saying that Plan B prevents attachment of a fertilized egg to the uterus. Um, and uses that to say Plan B is an abortifacient. So this is just another example of a prominent anti-abortion entity equating birth control with abortion. Um, and then this is just another example. So in 2018, Iowans for Life wrote a blog post claiming that the IUD causes abortions. Um, and, you know, they say all of these things, um, the IUD works in only one way, ending the life of a newly formed baby. So um, according to them, the science says that this is an abortion. Um, and then one other thing that I wanted to point out is that in a recent episode of the End Abortion podcast hosted by Priest for Life, um, Father Frank Pavone received a question about the legality of the morning after pill or plan B. 
So in response to a question about the legality of Plan B, he says, laws prohibiting abortion have to be clear that it includes all different types of abortion, no matter what the method. And so this is indicating to us that he thinks abortion bans should include forms of contraception that the anti-abortion movement claims cause abortions, which is very concerning. So we can kind of see um, sort of their strategy, which Aaron was talking about earlier. Um, so they claim that all of these forms of birth control cause abortions and that therefore they can outlaw them. And then finally, to provide some context to this conversation about what's currently going on, um, a pharmacist in Minnesota in 2019 refused to fill a woman's prescription for emergency contraception because of his religious beliefs. The woman then sued the pharmacy under Minnesota's Human Rights Act. Um, and the slide says that the case is ongoing, but actually last week on Friday, the jury found that her rights were not violated. So they sided with the pharmacist. Um, and this is definitely an extremely concerning case that sets a dangerous precedent that the anti-abortion pharmacists and doctors can deny care and prescriptions to people simply because of their beliefs. Um, and Aaron alluded to this earlier as well, um, but you know, as the anti-abortion movement continues to push these ideas around birth control, as we're already seeing with all these examples, we may see more instances like this one. And as well, the anti-abortion movement is really keen to promote the idea of religious freedom for anti-abortion healthcare professionals, and this case really only makes their argument stronger. All right, thank you so much for that, Anvita. That was um, terrifying. And I wanna be clear that we are not trying to spread the anti-abortion disinformation and everything that we just shared about what they're saying about birth controls is lies and the science does not back that up. Um, but it does, it is really important to be aware of where they are heading. Um, just as Anvita pointed out with that example with um, Frank Pavone, where they really are trying to assert that um, abortion bans should also become in effect birth control bans. Um, so very excited to introduce our first panelist, Angela Maskey, who is the Strategic Projects Manager at Advocates for Youth. Um, in this role, An Angela manages the Free the Pill Youth Council, a group of young people fighting to bring the birth control pill over the counter and for increased contraceptive active access in their communities. Fist pump for that. Um, she also manages the Condom Collective, the Youth Activist Alumni Program, and supports the AMAZE Program to produce creative strategies and content to reach young people with accurate age-appropriate sex education. Angela holds um, a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Global Health from Georgetown University, where she first began organizing around sexual and reproductive health care. During this time, they worked to establish Georgetown's first emergency contraception delivery program, founded a peer sexual health resource, and organized for increased access to, S to free STI testing. Her master's scholarly research investigated demographic and behavioral factors associated with the utilization of HIV and reproductive health services among young women in Eswatini. Angela, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Erin. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's, it's truly a pleasure to have you. So let's dive right in about the Free the Pill campaign. And you know, I just want to say, like, as an aside, it seems bananas to me with how many people use the pill and how safe and common and effective it is that, like, we have to navigate prescriptions at all. It's kind of mind boggling if one steps out of it. Like, there's so many other drugs that seem to be much more complicated that people are getting over the counter. So, um, if you could share with our listeners, what is the biggest challenge to bringing birth control over the counter in the U.S., and why is this campaign so important? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it, it's really hard to objectively say what is the biggest challenge to bringing birth control over the counter, but I think, um, you know, what we've seen in conversations with policymakers and media, for example, is that a lot of folks, you know, quote unquote, at the top, don't understand how accessing the birth control pill is still very difficult for many people across the U.S. with the current prescription requirement. Um, and so a lot of these folks who are making decisions um, are under the impression that the current system works, that everyone who wants birth control pills are able to get them, 
Um, and so they think that bringing a birth control pill over the counter just isn't necessary because, you know, it's fine as it is. Um, but, you know, we know from doing this work that birth control is, is simply out of reach or functionally inaccessible for so many individuals. I know that I've seen this in my role working directly with young people, collecting survey responses on birth control access and things like that. Um, and so as there often is, there's a disconnect between the people who are making decisions about our bodies and sharing this information and the people who are actually experiencing the reality of the system we have day to day. And so this has definitely been a challenge, um, you know, in this work. Thank you for that. Um, my next question for you is, what's your take on why the anti-abortion movement opposes birth control and contraceptive access? Yeah, so I think you actually explained it really well, Erin. Um, I mean, you know, we, we know that the fact is that it was never really about preventing abortions. Um, what it is about is restricting bodily autonomy, pushing puritanical values and morals, um, and imposing behavior deemed as, you know, quote unquote, suitable for people with reproductive capacity and punishing behavior deemed unsuitable. Um, and, you know, I think that the connections you made to, to white supremacy and um, reproductive control um, are, are so important. Um, like, it's really important for us to make those connections because when you pull that all together, it really makes a lot of sense that, that this is part of their larger agenda. Um, and so that's why we also see um, this going hand in hand with attacks on things like trans rights and accurate age appropriate sex education. Um, it's part of this larger agenda and, and all of those issues are interconnected. Thank you and uh, really appreciate you lifting up the interconnections and attacks on trans rights and just thinking a lot about young people right now in this, in this country um, and also sex ed. It's so important to highlight that. Um, so when we think about contraceptive access, why is it Im so deeply important for people to center young people in the struggle to increase access to contraception? And what does it mean to center young people in the struggle to increase access to contraception? Absolutely. So, you know, as someone who works directly with young people, um, I've been able to see just how difficult it can be for them, um, you know, young people in particular, to access birth control um, when, it when it requires a prescription. Um, so many young people that I've either worked with um, or I've heard stories from um, have described significant barriers, you know, that people of all ages may face, um, like long wait times for doctor's appointments, insurance or prescription problems, and cost issues. Um, but young people face unique barriers that can make accessing birth control pills with a prescription requirement even more difficult. Um, so, for example, young people may have a harder time accessing transportation for doctor's appointments um, and to pick up prescriptions within pharmacy hours. Um, and young people are also often barred by their parents or healthcare provider for, from getting a prescription um, for birth control. You know, despite the evidence that young people people are able to self-screen for side effects and contraindications effectively. Um, we see that in, in the research. Um, and so in our work to collect stories about barriers to accessing the pill, we've actually had numerous young people tell us that doctors and healthcare providers have been extremely judgmental, have inquired excessively about their sex lives in a non-medically necessary way, um, have intentionally embarrassed or harassed them about their use of the pill. Um, and so these are these are barriers that are specific to young people um, that you know, older people may not necessarily face. Um, and so we see the result is that some young people are going on and off the pill, um, which can cause you know, a number of very unpleasant uh, side effects um, when they're you know, constantly starting a medication, stopping it, going back on it, um, and then getting off of it when they need to be on it. Um, and some even need emergency contraception after experiencing gaps in their birth control pill access. Um, and so, you know, we know that if birth control pills were made available without a prescription, many of these barriers would be alleviated. Um, but when the conversation about contraceptive access um, doesn't take into account the unique barriers of groups such as young people, um, those barriers are hidden and we end up with the erroneous widespread belief um, like I mentioned uh, in the first question, that the pill is accessible for all with a prescription requirement, and, and that's just not true. 
Thank you so much, um, Angela. This has been um, just immensely helpful in expanding understanding for our listeners. And it's so important to center young people in this struggle and just mad appreciation for the work that you do, for the work that Advocates for Youth does. Um, just a, a, a bonus additional question from me is, um, so how, if you could share a little more about um, both the Free the Pill campaign as well as Advocates for Youth and let our listeners know how they can engage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, one really exciting thing that we're working on now that I'm sure a lot of listeners are aware of is that um, we have seen the first ever application to the FDA for an over-the-counter pill that just happened uh, very recently. And so we'll be waiting on the FDA to make their decision um, within about the next year or so on whether or not they will approve this over-the-counter pill. So it's a really exciting time um, and it's the culmination of many, many years of work. Um, but you know, one thing that folks can do um, if they want to support this work now, um, it's to help us by collecting more of these, uh, more of this data and these stories about barriers to birth control access that we can share with media and policymakers to show that this issue is important. Um, and so you can take the survey that we're um, that we have out right now and share it with your friends and colleagues and peers. Um, and you can find that at advocatesforyouth.org/freethepill no spaces, no um, punctuation or anything like that. Um, and, you know, while we continue to share these stories and wait for the FDA to make its decision, um, we can continue to um, ensure that a lot of folks are aware of this issue and um, that hopefully we'll, we'll see success when the FDA decides. Oh, I cannot wait for that wonderful day. And I have a lot of optimism about this because the science is just overwhelming um, that birth control is safe and effective and it works. And that um, to to speaking to the research that you've been talking about, that um, that people aren't stupid and young people in particular aren't stupid and that they're able to uh, take this medication appropriately and um, which is just a game changer in terms of our ability to control our bodies and lives. So I'm really excited to have you here. Thank you, Angela. Anyone with questions for Angela, just put them in the questions tab and we'll get to as many as possible at the end. And I will pass it back to my colleague Ambita for our next panelist. Awesome. So I'm very excited to introduce Nicola. So Nicola Brogan, MSCRN, is a fierce advocate and researcher specializing in women's reproductive health. Jumping into the scene six years ago, Nicola found her passion for sexual health when she completed her undergraduate honors thesis exploring long-acting contraception use across Canada. Honing her skills, she continued to a master's degree in interdisciplinary health sciences, where she concentrated on adolescence use and access to contraception in rural Ontario. She also holds her bachelor's of science in nursing from the University of Rochester. She has been working with the American Society for Emergency Contraception for four years, assisting with the planning of the annual meeting, the EC Jamboree, as well as developing fact sheets and coordinating this initiative. Nicola is the proud founder of Thrive Like a Girl, a youth initiative that empowers girls and women to explore themselves and actively break down societal barriers surrounding self-esteem, confidence, and reproductive autonomy. Thank you so much for joining us, Nicola. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking. All right, so our first question for you, Nicola, is how has your work to bring emergency contraception to college campuses changed since the fall of Roe v. Wade? And how do you see it going forward in this new era that we have now? Yeah, so um, just to give folks a little bit of context of what we were doing before the fall of Roe v. Wade. Um, in 2020, ASEC launched a campus initiative called Emergency Contraception for Every Campus, also known as EC for EC. And we basically have been spending the last couple of years assisting student activists with developing access points to emergency contraception on their campus through one of two branches. The first being a peer-to-peer -peer model where they distribute through a hotline um, kind of scenario or through the implementation of EC vending machines. Um, so since the fall, we've seen a huge increase in students interested in 
uh, increasing access on campus and learning more about what they can do and expediting the rate of which these projects are introduced. And so um, we've really been just trying to ramp up our networking with new campuses in preparation for this new academic year so that we can not only expand our reach to more students, but also assist them with this expedition of their EC access projects through connections with partners in the field and through um, helping them solidify product donations so that they have the tools to get going come September. Um, we are also always working on new and updating our existing fact sheets so that we can continue to address the common myths and stigma that comes up surrounding emergency contraception. Um, specifically right now, we've recently launched a new fact sheet that addresses the mechanism of action and we've actually been really fortunate to um, have had some translation services provided so that we can offer this fact sheet in both English and Spanish. Um, and then, yeah, we are con consistently working with our colleagues. We are reaching out to more colleagues in the field to figure out how we can ensure that there's consistent product availability for student activists to stock their hotlines and to stock vending machines. Um, and then we also are fortunate enough to be able to provide student activists with starter kits where we can provide them with at least 20 packs of EC to get started while they work out the kinks of figuring out where their product will be coming from in the future. And then right now, um, we're also really focusing and closely monitoring on legal changes that affect the sale of EC, especially when it comes to a vending machine model, because um, as I'm sure everyone is holding their breath about with the fall of Roe v. Wade, EC and contraception is for sure the next to be attacked. And so while states have been working to legalize the sale of EC in vending machines, I am sure that there are states that are looking at ways to now block that to prevent the kind of work that we're doing. Um, and so kind of knowing all of this is going on, really moving forward into the future, we're just looking to solidify our sustainability of EC for EC. And we're doing that through exploring new funding opportunities and um, gaining technical support from our colleagues to ensure that we are up to date on everything that we possibly can be. So we're assisting our student activists in the best way possible. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think, you know, definitely since the fall of Roe v. Wade, like this work is more important than ever. Um, and I'm particularly excited about the language justice piece that you mentioned. That's really awesome. Um, so you kind of alluded to this next question um, when you were just talking, but what do you think are the biggest threats to emergency contraception access in the US right now? Yeah, so definitely the biggest threats are um, the ongoing misinformation around what EC is and how it works. And then just the stigma about using EC and um, you know, the the poor picture of what folks are like if they need EC because people just really don't look at the full picture of, you know, there can be a million reasons why you need it and it doesn't matter what that reason is, you should have access to it. Um, and so, you know, prior to the fall of Roe v. Wade, we were seeing EC being associated with the abortion pill and having similar mechanisms of action, not unlike how everybody has discussed on this webinar today. Um, but it's really am like amplified since the fall. And so this ongoing association adds an extra layer of complexity when we're trying to promote access to EC because people who are living in restricted areas are not only confused by their new abortion restrictions and what that means to them if they need access to an abortion, but they're also confused about how these restrictions apply to their access to EC because of that conflation between mechanisms of actions. Um, and then on top of that, people are also feeling more scared and uncomfortable with the idea of accessing EC, even if they're aware of what it is and how it differs from a medication abortion, you know, living in more restricted areas and seeing what's going on in the media can make it a really nerve wracking experience to have to go and access it either in person or through a provider or however they're getting it in their community. Um, and then also just like the wide scale misconception that's happening. Um, it fuels the fire that the legislators are using who support the anti-abortion movement um, in their exploration of how they can restrict other important reproductive health products like contraception and EC. Absolutely, thank you for explaining all of that. Um, I think that was a really clear explanation of what the landscape is right now. Um, so moving on to our 
Final question for this portion, you know, since you've done so much work in Canada and internationally, um, I think it would be really helpful if you could talk about um, what is unique about the contraceptive landscape here in the US compared to other countries? Yeah, this is this was actually a really hard question um, for me to think through because I, as much as I'm Canadian, I've been doing this work in the US now for most of my career in reproductive health. Um, so, but, you know, reflecting on, I think, What's most unique to me is the fact that insurance coverage is employer based. Um, you know, if you compare it to Canada, we don't, I mean, we have private insurance, but because we're a socialized healthcare system, um, it's not, a, there's not as much emphasis on those private plans. And so knowing that insurance coverage is employer based, um, you know, people fall through the cracks and they are put into really complicated. Um, parts of the fragmented system and because of all that you know reimbursement rates are low and they may not be able to get the exact option that they're looking for because their insurance doesn't cover let's say Depo-Provera but they're willing to cover the pill and so it can be really hard for folks to navigate the system not only from finding a provider who accepts their insurance whether that's Medicaid or employer-based um, but also making sure that whatever insurance policy they have works for the decisions that they're trying to make instead of just making a decision and knowing that their insurance coverage supports that um and then you know not this is not necessarily unique to the us but um the heightened conscientious objection that we're seeing from providers who don't necessarily agree with um, a product that you're trying to access and the protection that these providers have is just absolutely astonishing i i can't imagine myself being an rn i couldn't imagine um, allowing my own biases to dictate how somebody else accesses health services and, you know, decides to regulate their own health. And so there's definitely been an uptick in this with the anti-abortion movement's momentum and the fall of Roe v. Wade, and um, it's only going to continue to become more prevalent. And so watching that in the landscape and seeing how we can combat that is really important. Thank you so much, Nicola. This was really helpful. Um, and I think it's really important for us to think about, you know, um, everything you mentioned, like how people can fall through the cracks um, and how people are really, you know, being marginalized by the systems that we have in place here in the US. So thank you so much for that. So before we go on to the audience Q&A portion, um, if you're interested in being more involved with ReproAction, please go ahead and sign up for alerts from us at www.reproaction.org. Um, you can also find out more about all of our various campaigns um, at that website. And um, you can also follow us on social media. We are ReproAction on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and then the next thing we have for y'all is um, this suggested tweet, if you'd like to show your support for access to birth control after this webinar. Um, and we know that, you know, as we've talked about, the anti-abortion movement really wants to control reproductive autonomy and bodily autonomy um, by restricting access to birth control. But all of us, including young people, deserve to have access to the full range of contraceptive options and abortion. All right, well, I will take it from here and thank you so much, Amita and Nicola, that was profound um, and just action packed and so many things to think about and reflect upon. Um, and in particular, I know I'm sitting with, um, I, I just wanna resonate like how important it, it is to think about the fact that our health insurance system is fundamentally broken in the United States and that it is even bound upon employment in order to, um, frankly, to be able to live um, what that often health insurance often means for people. It's just unconscionable. So thank you for that. Um, so we're really excited for our webinar next month and hope that you'll save the date for it. We'll talk about access to abortion care for young people, really important um, topic in times like these. It will take place on Tuesday, September 27th from 12 to 1 Eastern. And if you sign up for our um, 
email alerts at reproaction.org, you will not miss that invitation. So please do sign up. Um, we do these Act and Learn webinars every month and they are free and open to the public and we definitely want you to come and feel free to spread the word. So um, anything else, uh, uh, we're gonna move into Q&A now. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the questions tab. Um, and we'll start with a question from a listener that um, that says that the listener has to be on birth control for medical reasons. If birth control is banned, what will happen for people like me? Who would like to take that first? Um, or who would like to take that? I'll just open that up to our panelists. I can take that actually. Um, so, I mean, it is, it's hard to know, unfortunately, but I can say from, um, you know, the experiences, like what I've already seen is that, you know, for young people, even currently when they're going into their doctor's office to ask for birth control because they have severe cramps um, or they're, um, you know, trying to uh, alleviate other symptoms um, that, you know, we know birth control um, can help with and that many pills are approved for. Um, we're still seeing providers refuse to provide prescriptions for birth control for young people for those reasons. Um, and so unfortunately, I think there is a kind of dangerous precedent there when, you know, folks need birth control for other reasons because it is a contraceptive product there it's still deemed as something that is like well we can't prescribe that to a young person because of xyz moral reasons and so it, it wouldn't be surprising to me unfortunately um if we were to see a birth control ban um, or a restriction of it um throughout the u.s that those kind of issues would would not be considered um but it, but it is hard to say but i think that makes it all the more important that we're fighting to protect birth control access um, for everyone who needs it, regardless of the reason. Great, thank you so much for that, Angela. Um, so the next question, um, it's, this is a great question and I'd love to start with Nicola on this one because it's been, this is a especially happened to emergency contraception. And the question is, um, I understand that the anti-abortion movement is using a strategy of conflating birth control with abortifacients to fight against access to birth control, but I feel unsure how to fight back against that. Um, how, does, uh, how do you all approach that at the American Society for Emergency Contraception, Nicola? Yeah, thank you for that question. It, it's definitely a hard conversation to have, um, especially when sometimes you feel like you're just up against a brick wall. And so, you know, what we first suggest is just getting really comfortable with the material, um, you know, really learning about what the mechanism of action is and, you know, the different options under EC and knowing the difference between Plan B and Ella versus having one of the IUDs inserted, um, just so that you know your base content in case you need to rebut some of their own points. Um, and then, you know, learning, we offer a couple fact sheets. One of them is like a myths and facts fact sheet where it states the common myth and how you can kind of chat through it. So we we typically recommend that people use that as a template and, um, you know, just going about it in a really constructive way. You know, these are hard conversations to have, um, especially when it comes to like, really big differences in values and so being able to do it constructively and not get uh, you know elevated in the conversation is typically the best way to do it um unfortunately it's it is more difficult in the u.s because of the language that is placed on leaving adjustable ecs packaging around um you know the potential to prevent implantation and how that can be skewed as an abortifacient and so just you know i think the best is to just get really comfortable with the information use some of our resources which you can find online um, and just you know maybe have a practice conversation with somebody who has similar views so that you can kind of work through the kinks that you might experience in that kind of conversation and hopefully be prepared when you do try to 
educate somebody on why they are misinformed. Thank you so much for that, Nicola. And I just want to say very clearly um, for our, our listeners so that they know this is something that come up a lot in my own conversations and sometimes being challenged by anti-abortion people. Like, let's have a let's have a medical definition of pregnancy and be clear on what that is. The medical definition of pregnancy occurs after implantation. Um, so a fertilized egg is not a pregnancy um, that only occurs following implantation. So it's simply impossible to have an abortion if a person is not pregnant yet. Um, contrary to the disinformation um, that I shared and that Amvita shared earlier, where they're making up terms out of whole cloth of like silent abortions and early term abortions and like abortions we're not even aware we're having because Oh my gosh, um, apparently they think we're in a constant state of abortion now if we're using um, contraception. So, um, and I just really want to just thank you, Nicola, for the practice. That was really great, um, a great tip. So um, a next question came up um, saying, how could I learn more about the connections between white supremacy and anti-abortion activism? Are there things I could read? I'm going to take this one. I love this question. Um, because I think one of the things that I've noticed in our webinars is that you know we're primarily working with people who care about these issues. And I, I sense this is an area where a lot of folks feel like they could have um, more uh, support in understanding the connections. And the good piece, the good news is, is that we actually have, I'm putting it in the chat right now, that ReproAction did a webinar on white supremacy and the anti-abortion movement. Um, so you can check that out. Um, and then I'll just open it up to, um, all of our panelists to see if there's anything else they'd like to suggest on that front. Cool. Um, uh, next uh, question, um, this is a great one, um, it goes straight to um, my Opposition-focused heart, um, could you speak a bit about the org Students for Life and Live Action who have social media content with um, misinformation about birth control? And I'll just even first off say, like before even diving into the question, um, let's not give them misinformation. Misinformation is information that is not um, true, but a person may not be aware of it. They definitely know they're lying, and so it's disinformation, um, but it's a great question. Um, Anvita, uh, is there anything you'd like to set the table with about Students for Life or live action? Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the social media strategies that they're using. Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's important to um, remember that these organizations really rely on um, at least in my opinion, they really rely on like sensationalizing information and really like pushing a narrative. Um, and so I think they're really good at picking and choosing which narratives they want to push. Um, and that's why we're seeing social media content with this disinformation, um, because, you know, they kind of want to set the scene and um, build this foundation for them to expand on later. Um, so that's what I would say, um, just to like provide context for these organizations for people who aren't familiar with them. Yeah, thank you for that, Anvita. That's great context. Um, so these are two distinct organizations. Students for Life, as I covered earlier, is really a massive right-wing machine that aims to present itself as if it was some grassrootsy on-campus thing when it is not. Um, live action is, um, is a very aggressive, is likewise a very, very aggressive group. Um, one thing that ties these two groups together is they really do pump out a lot of disinformation online um, and try to set the tone of debate. And um, what I'd like to highlight here that's really important, in, and this dovetails actually with the webinar we hosted last month on big tech and um, uh, problems with accessing um, accurate reproductive health information online is that they are pumping 
tons of money into putting disinformation online and the social media companies have basically rolled over and they're allowing it to happen in violation of their facially neutral policies that actually would prohibit things like live action sends out um sends out ads promoting the theory of abortion pill reversal which isn't tested um you know house judiciary chair jerry nadler wrote a letter to Mar meta chairman mark zuckerberg um, protesting those. And there's been a lot of work in this regard. So it's a huge area. And it's one that we're working on with a lot of activism at Repro Action. And I just in, uh, encourage folks to sign up for the list, um, our list at reproaction.org, if you'd like any opportunities to take action. Um, before I go, um, just one other piece, because we do have a lot of expertise among our panelists on campus activism between both all the work that American Society for Emergency Contraception does and, of course, Advocates for Youth. Um, if there's anything else either of you would like to add to that. Yeah, um, I just want to add that uh, from what we've seen from our student activists across campuses, um, they're they're just a really tight knit group and um yeah they use a lot of sensational information to try to augment their space or how much space they take up and um they really do fight back and on campuses that are more con you know restrictive and conservative they take the their the priority and they can often overshadow our students so just to be aware that they are a strong group of people, but we can be stronger and we are stronger with the power of numbers. Yeah, and I'll also add that I think, you know, as loud as these groups are, um, I think it's it's really important to remember that there is still, you know, as Aaron mentioned at the beginning, mm -hmm. very widespread support um, for birth control and contraceptive access throughout the US. Um, and like that's something that I've seen myself that has surprised me doing this work. Um, you know, even a couple of months ago, my colleague and I were outside the White House filming a video talking to folks about how they feel about over-the-counter birth control. And we were shocked to see that people were overwhelmingly supportive. Um, and this is, you know, a lot of tourists and stuff outside the White House. So I think it's really important to remember that amongst young people in particular, like birth control is still very popular and that we shouldn't allow um, the anti-abortion movement to control the narrative and make it seem as if, um, you know, this is a controversial topic when in reality we know that it, it isn't. Thank you so much for that, Angela and Nicola and Anvita. Really appreciate it. So, um, so this is a question, Nicola, that I'm sure that you'll like. Um, just asking, could you please link to the fact sheets that um, American Society for Emergency Contraception has? Um, and the, just the person wants to make sure that they're in the right spot on the website. Um, Nicola, if, uh, if you want to send those to Anvita after the webinar, we will also send out the link to those fact sheets in the follow-up email that will go to all participants as well. So. Um, we can certainly send those out. Um, okay, the next question um, is, do these attacks on abortion access rely on misunderstanding of how birth control works, not just on the part of anti-abortion activists who are trying to get more white babies for the purpose of white supremacy, but just on the part of the public? Does the public misunderstand how birth control works? Um, so. Um, I would love to hear um, both of our panelists. So whoever would like to go first. Um, I think just speaking to my prior point, um, it, in my experience, so it's just speaking from, from my interactions with folks and like the data I've seen, for example, um, I actually don't think that the the public and the majority of folks in the U.S. misunderstand how birth control works. Um, you know, again, when we were outside the White House, we had like a little trivia game we were doing that was, you know, a little bit silly. Um, but one of the questions was, how does birth control work? And most people who who took our little quiz um, got that question right. Um, and so, of course, that's a very, very small sample, right? But 
I think, again, that um, mm -hmm. there's the reason that the anti-abortion movement is trying to spread these lies is to counteract this, the widespread knowledge, the widespread accurate knowledge that most folks have and make them question that. Um, and so, so that's my understanding of it. Um, but I think that, you know, that doesn't mean we should kind of be complacent. We should still be pushing to make sure folks really do understand how birth control works um, in order to combat this ongoing um, misinformation lies that are coming from, from anti-abortion movement people. Um, yeah, and, and just to follow up on that, like speaking more specifically to EC, I definitely think they do rely on um, the lack of knowledge that folks have about EC. Uh, recently, we conducted um, some research specifically to our campus initiative project on looking at people's knowledge of EC and understand, better understanding the access points that exist on campuses already. And so, you know, we interviewed 24 uh, respondents who are student activists who, you know, are well versed in EC to a certain degree. And so people that we would assume would be likely better informed. And yet we were still seeing the same misconceptions about how, um, you know, if you take it while you're pregnant, it can terminate a pregnancy. Or if you take it too many times, it can affect your fertility. And so um, I think you know, the lack of knowledge that still exists surrounding EC is definitely prevalent and a huge gap that they like to prey on. And so that's what we're trying to do is to fill that gap and to make sure we can educate people as quickly as possible so that um, they aren't getting the wrong information. Thank you so much. Um, and this question says, um, I think it, this refers to some of the language that we've been using. I know that I've been using. I thought the pro-choice movement is trying to move away from using the term pro-life to reference anti-choice folks. And I want to be very clear. Uh, this is a great question. And just to answer it directly. So at Reproaction, we do say pro-life to describe them. Yes, we know that they're not pro-life. Yes, we know that that is a disingenuous term. But we feel it's very strongly that since that is the term that the media is largely using, that it is important to um, use common language so that uh, so that people know exactly who we're talking about. And it sure does uh, make it easy to point out the hypocrisy since they are, of course, anything but pro-life. Um, so we are almost at time, and I'm actually going to close up with something that came in the questions box and says it uh, says it in a way that I just want to give right back to our panelists and, of course, to Anvita. Thank you. Excellent information and perspective. And I just want to say that these are dark times for our country, but there are some real silver linings, in, uh, 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 not silver linings, but glimmers of hope. Um, on the horizon. I'm really excited about the developments, um, hoping for that birth control pill to get approved so that we can have that over the counter. That'll be huge, especially for young people. Um, I'm so inspired by the activism that's happening around emergency contraception, particularly with um, folks providing mutual aid and the, uh, uh, the vending machines. There's just so much good work happening in this field that we also need to lift that up while being very clear eyed that yes, the antis are already coming for the birth control. So we will close this uh, for the month. We will see you next month. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you to Angela and to Nicola. And of course, to my colleague, Ambita, who put together this amazing webinar. Thank you. <laughs>